Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, another series of our uh, speaker series here at the American Sleep Apnea Association. I'm going to be your host today, Justine Amder. I'm a program coordinator at sleepapnea.org. And we are here to reach out to our community and all individuals uh, that are interested in uh, talking about um, what is happening with the current COVID-19 quarantine and mental health issues. That is our topic for today. Um, we are happy to have back Dr. Michael Grander. Uh, he's joined us on other occasions. Uh, he is currently the Director of Sleep and Health Research Program and Assistant Associate, Assistant Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Tucson. And he is a board certified um, behavioral sleep medicine uh, physician. Um, we also have joining us today two of our sleepapnea.org leaders. Teresa Schumard is here. She's our patient community leader and board member, as well as Jills Friedman, who is our chief strategy officer. He is a co-founder of ACOR and Smart Patients, and he's back as they are back as one of our returning guests. Um, so we are all very aware of what is going on with the current COVID-19 virus and the physical uh, illness that's associated with the um, condition, but we are all uh, dealing with a quarantine aspect, and we are here today to talk about how that's affecting our sleep and our mental health state. Um, I do also want to point out that since we're talking about mental health and dealing with the quarantine and everything that that uh, brings with it, uh, there, if you are in need of talking to someone uh, about how you're feeling, there are some um, lo um, telephone numbers that we're going to give at the end of today's video, but you can reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or the Veterans Crisis Line. You can find those numbers online. We just want to encourage everyone that's having some issues to, to reach out to someone to, uh, to talk to. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Teresa to get started with um, Dr. Grander. Well, hello, Dr. Grander. I'm hello. so happy to see you again. I, <laughs> I don't want to sound like a, a nerd or a groupie, but you're one of my favorite sleep experts. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're you're so real, you know, and, and, and we appreciate that in the patient community. Let's talk a little bit today about this social uh, interaction decrease that everybody's having because yeah. we're told, you know, stay in, stay in. Now, before the pandemic, whether you were highly engaged socially, you know, and have a job where you go to the office, whatever, you know, or that type of lifestyle and sort of an extrovert, if you will. Or, you know, you could have the person who is somewhat, you know, a recluse, uh, maybe an introvert, and maybe they don't go or, you know, go for that kind of uh, socialization. So, I mean, this is really impacting two different groups of people. Which group do you feel seems to have more difficulty with this new normal? Well, um, you know, I, I don't think it has to be a competition. Like, I don't think one has to be worse. And uh, I, I think everyone is facing their own challenges. You know, everyone, everyone has their own life. And, and, and it's very different. And for everybody, this, the challenges can be very different. You know, for some people, um, social distancing is also meaning social isolation, where it doesn't have to be. We, we have the technology where we, that doesn't always have to be that way, but for some people it is. Some people are probably enjoying um, the, the having permission to stay inside and not engage with a lot of people because for them, engaging with people could be draining. For other people, it could be very restricting. Um, but I, I, think, I think the point you're speaking to is that you know, we're, we're all in these different situations. And for some people, this, this is much harder than for other people. So like people who have an older or sick family member um, who is, you know, like I've got a family rent member right now who came out of the hospital, was in a rehab facility. No one could visit them. Were, were, they, were they being taken good care of? We don't even know. You know, it, it's hard to engage. And, and then moving them out, is a very stressful situation, and especially when we can't be involved. Um, lots of people are going through this. Um, or, or people who 
um, have lost their job right now at the exact moment when they've also lost their social support network. I mean, there's all these real life things happening that are complicated um, and, and we might not necessarily know what the best and, and healthiest way to deal with these things are. And as if there was one right answer either, you know, I think the point is that, you know, for some of us, this comes with some relief, you know, people might not need to get up at five o'clock in the morning to go to work if they don't have to, but at the same time, it leads to stresses as well. It's just different. Uh, and I think that for a lot of people, we're, um, we're making our way through this one step at a time. Yes, I agree. Um, it's been a big change in our household as well with, uh, you know, having a 12-year-old in online schooling and trying to figure out what the new routine is. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, some, as you said, sometimes people have uh, full houses like mine and yours, and sometimes people are a little bit more, you know, more secluded. So, um, you know, there's also that balance of, uh, those people that you know may just maybe just live alone. There's that that loneliness aspect that we're talking about, and then for you know my house, we're together all the time now. <laughs> so there's the there's the opposite you know balance uh, balance to that part. You know, and some people like like I've got the luxury of being in a place that has a backyard and a neighborhood that I can walk around in without worrying about getting within six feet of people on a regular basis, but I can still wave hi to the neighbors you know, where some people are stuck in apartments and, you know, I've got, I've got some cousins in apartments that are way too small for, for them and their spouse and two kids, but you know, they live in a city where that's what they have to do. Now imagine being stuck in there all the time. Um, it's gotta be hard for some people. And, and I think most of us, um, have had the experience where, um, where we've, been able to go a little easier on ourselves, or at least we're trying to figure out how to do that and, and on each other. And I think that's great. It's not universal, unfortunately. Um, but look, we're in the middle of a thing. You know, we're, we're allowed to be in the middle of a thing if we're in the middle of a thing. And I think we need to give ourselves permission to not have everything be perfect. I think it, it's worth it to try, but um, we need to give ourselves permission to, to figure this out. Do you think that that will give more of a comfort, sort of a comfortable solitude, you know, you know, things that people can, you know, do you have any suggestions, things that people could do to, to help that loneliness and get into that sweet spot of comfort and solitude? I like being alone. So, you know, I, you know, I, I kind of been training for this a long time. <laughs> I mean, I work with people every day, but I'm in my house. So anyway, it's, you know, like you said, different situations, but any tips, we would yeah. love to hear your, your tips. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think for some, I think it depends on where the friction is. If the friction is that you're, you're struggling being alone because you feel like you need to reach out to people and can't. You know, then then maybe you need to get creative on how to reach out to people, whether it's calling or, or FaceTiming or whatever. Um, for some people, you know, there's this, there's this, I had a friend post a thing on Facebook saying that, um, so I've been in quarantine for three weeks, my closets are not all reorganized, and uh, my my to-do list isn't smaller. Clearly what I didn't need was more time, you know, and, and I think that for some people what that means is that, um, you know, people are looking for this time as an opportunity to get to all that stuff they've been putting off when really the problem wasn't that they didn't have time to do it, it was that they were putting it off for other reasons. And now we're coming face to face with some of that. And so some people are, are alone and feeling guilty for not being more productive. Um, and I think, you know, some people are better at sort of just appreciating the quiet, you know, appreciate you know, maybe being left alone for a little bit and having some time to yourself or some time to catch up on stuff you wanted to do, um, some time to read, um, and actually some time to be distracted for a while. It's okay to be distracted for a while when you have nowhere else to be, and, and that might help take you out of the situation for a little bit. Um, you know, 
this ties back a lot to sleep because a lot of people with insomnia are faced with this, where they're up during the night on their own with nobody else around them, with nothing else to do. And so they say, okay, when I get up during the night, what should I do? And usually what I say is, it doesn't matter. You know, right now, you know, the, your, your goal isn't to be as productive as possible. Like we live in a society, especially American society, where nothing is more un-American than unproductive time, right? And, and we see sleep as unproductive time. And now we have potentially these, these periods during the day that are seen as unproductive. What does that even mean? You know, isn't it productive to, um, to be able to spend time with your family, to be able to learn something new, to be able to actually even just detach for a little bit can actually be very productive because it's an investment in yourself um, and it's an investment in your own mental health and it's an investment in your own well-being. So I, I don't think we should think about productivity just as a short-term, um, how many widgets did I produce today? At the end of the day, you know, it's it, you're also making an investment in yourself, and you know we should be making these investments. I think when when we were talking a little bit before uh, the show, uh, Gilles was talking about his uh, telling a story about his daughter uh, who's an artist, and I think it's kind of along the lines of what you were saying. If he'd like to just share a little snippet on that, um, I think it would be would be interesting. Yes. <clears throat> so my daughter uh, lives in Paris in an apartment and uh, because it's in Paris, in the heart of Paris, she hasn't been able to get out at all for weeks now. And she was telling me that, in fact, she's having a, a pretty good time because her and a large network of young artists are communicating all the time and telling each other how great this is a time because they have all the time in the world to be creative and to create their art. And I think that I'm going to uh, do a series of uh, like an event where we're going to try to bring lots of those young artists so they can tell their story. Yeah, sometimes it just gives us room to breathe. And that's okay. Yeah. And in talking about uh, breathing, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the anxiety that, that uh, this time is now creating. Um, I mean, I can even give a personal example. A couple of days ago, I'm here in the house all day, and I probably had a little bit too much coffee throughout the day, and I started to not feel well. And then by not feeling well, I started to think about all the things that it, it could be that is making me not feel well. And, you know, getting into the whole idea of the virus, and am I getting sick, and am I this, when really... I just kind of overdid it a little bit. So I said to myself, you know what? I just, I need to like regroup here for a couple of minutes. Just go lie down, take a nap. But, you know, I'm not usually one to have anxiety, panic attacks, but um, this is definitely a unique time. And, uh, you know, I had to, to catch myself uh, in, that, in that moment. Yeah. So, I mean, a global pandemic is, is, is actually an acceptable time to be stressed, um, right? You know, and, and I think and I think this it's not just stressed about getting sick and about people being sick. It's also giving us the space to, you know, to, to call attention to all these other things that we're stressed about. Um, because it brings up these issues, you know, it, it brings up stress about society and, and, and any stresses we have about our communities and stresses we have about the future and stresses we have about politics. I mean, this becomes a lens that can focus on anything, um, and it has. I mean, you can see all the debates going on right now, where you know infection rates are sort of ancillary, or, or or they're they're sort of off to the side of what the actual discussion and stress is. You know, we're having discussions about liberty, and we're having discussions about food, and we're having discussions about minimum wage workers. Like all these things are coming out. And then people are having their own stresses about family um, and, and, and marriages and kids and like all these things that are being brought up um, by the situation. And I guess, you know, the first thing I want to say to that is um, don't avoid that because it was there. 
and and this is this is now an opportunity to, to face it. And when you are stressed, I mean, there's there's a few different approaches that people can take, and there's no one approach that works for everybody. Um, but if you're at the point where you're not able to deal, and um, and you you can't focus, and all you need to do is is relax. One thing I want to remind people is that. Sometimes distraction is very effective because it takes you out of your situation for a little while. Often it just presses pause though, and, um, and you're right back there once it's done. So for, for a lot of people, actually distraction isn't ideal. What's better is relaxation. And relaxation is like exercise. It's, it's an active process. You have to actively do it. Um, like a massage is relaxing. Sitting there isn't, just, isn't usually just as relaxing. So it's usually an active process. Um, and a good rule of thumb, so, so for people out there who are trying to figure out what kind of relaxation should I do, um, two things, two points of advice. One, no matter what it is, learn how to breathe. And you think for something that we've done thousands of times a day for pretty much our entire life, we'd be better at it, um, but we're not. And, and for most people have really have a hard time knowing how to breathe. And the way you want to breathe when you're stressed is what's called diaphragmatically. And what that means is you're breathing. So when you breathe, you're breathing in through your stomach. And, and, and when you breathe in, your stomach goes out, but your shoulders don't move. And you can take in a lot more air that way. You know, you could hold it for a teeny little bit. And then, you, and then you blow out. Again, your shoulders shouldn't be moving. The way to know you're doing it right is when you breathe in, your stomach goes out, but your shoulders don't move. And when you breathe in, your stomach comes in and your shoulders move. Um, and if you can breathe in really deeply that way, what you'll notice is not only are you taking in more air, um, but you might actually start to feel a little lightheaded um, because you, you, you're actually, um, when you breathe in all the way, it actually causes endorphin release and other things like that that help relax you physically. It also slows down your heart rate and your respiratory rate, and it can even slow your thoughts down and, and relax you a little bit. That's why this kind of breathing is like the foundation of any kind of relaxation technique like meditation or yoga or anything. Um, and another quick tip for people who are, um, who are struggling with figuring out how to do this right, um, a, a, a simple hack you can do is lay on your back because on your back, you have to breathe that way. Um, you'll notice when you lay on your back, you don't tighten your shoulders when you breathe. Um, you could you only breathe through your stomach. So and, and so practice that feeling. And just a few breaths. If you're breathing slow enough, you know you're only breathe. You you only have several breaths per minute. And if you do the, if you breathe in and out this way, say like ten times, you'll notice usually that things will start calming right down. So 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 tip number one is breathing and breathing correctly. Um, the second thing is if you're going to do some sort of relaxation technique, whether it's a muscle relaxation or a mental imagery or a meditation or something. So here's a good rule of thumb for you. If your problem is that you're stuck in your head and can't get out of your head, do a physical relaxation in your body. And if your problem is that you're physically uncomfortable and your muscles are tense and you have a hard time relaxing your muscles, go into your head. So like for people who are stuck in their head and can't get out of it, I wouldn't go right to a meditation because you'll talk yourself out of anything like at that point. What you do instead is you do a muscle relaxation or yoga or something where your, your mind can go wherever it wants to go, but your body is going to do its thing. And what will happen is your mind will start following. Same thing for people who just are physically uncomfortable. That's when you go into your mind with an imagery or a meditation or something that will help relax your body. I mean, there's some techniques that are mind and body. But that's a good rule of thumb for people. For people stuck in their head, don't um, don't seek relaxation in your head because it's 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 a mess right now. Like go go into your body and let that be the source of your relaxation. Then it'll 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 provide feedback and filter back through. I can totally relate to what you're saying because uh, the example I gave before, one of the reasons I wanted to take a nap was when I was having that panic attack was to put my CPAP machine on and I went and I lied down, I put my mask on, I was lying on my back and I was just breathing. That's, you know, and then I, you know, fell asleep for just a little bit, not, not yeah. too long, but that, you know, that uh, was um, what exactly helped me. Um, and, you know, your suggestion of whether it's meditation or yoga or 
you know, some other things, even for your body. I mean, one of the good resources I think we all have access to right now is since everyone is at home, um, there's a lot of things online that are out there now that, you know, people are offering for free, whether it's yoga or, you know, meditation or, or, um, you know, podcasts that you can listen, anything, you know, people are, are being very gracious in, in opening up their um, profession and, and helping people at this time. So, you know, it's a good time to take advantage uh, of those. Yeah, really true. Yeah. So, um, Jules, do you want to kind of jump here into the conversation with uh, Dr. Grander? Uh, yes. As a follow-up on uh, how to handle anxiety and uh, I lived in Israel in the late 70s when there were explosion buses and in markets all the time. And I remember very specifically that we were told to not fight the anxiety that was created because of those events and to let it run through us as the best way to uh, not suffer from PTSD in the future. Do you have anything to say about it? Um, for traumatic events, I, I don't think that's bad advice. I mean, we're, we're still trying to figure out the best way to deal with, with traumatic events. Um, and I think that to some degree, yeah. I mean, when you're faced with something really stressful, trying to shove it down and ignore it is not the solution. Um, sometimes, you know, when something terrible happens, you know, it, it's, it's a, there's a normal process. And trying to subvert that normal process you know, might cause problems later. So, if, you know, if, if water's trying to flow through a tube and you don't let it go, what you're going to do is you're going you're gonna to create a backup and a leak and a valve is going to burst somewhere. Um, the key is if, if, this, if this is water is making a mess, you don't try and block it all up. What you do is you try and redirect it. And sometimes you got to let it flow out a little bit so that you can redirect it. And I think it's similar for, for really stressful events. If you're at a point where you're stressed and you need to relax, then try and relax. But it doesn't mean that if, you know, let's say, you know, some, some, a family member of, of, of yours gets sick and, and dies during this. And, you know, you don't say, well, you know, I've got too much to worry about. I'm not going to deal with that. I mean, sometimes you just have to sit with yourself and, and you have to give yourself permission to be a human being and, and feel what you're going to feel because, you know, if you don't, you know, it may come out in other ways. I mean, it's a balance where, where people don't have to sit there and be emoting all the time about everything. But at the same time, people shouldn't be clamming up and repressing and suppressing everything either. The balance is somewhere in the middle where if you're at the point where you're incapacitated, the question should be, okay, is it reasonable to be incapacitated right now? And is this temporary? Because it's always supposed to be temporary. And sometimes that's okay. And now is actually a great time you know, if something terrible happens, like where we now have permission to sort of not leave the house for a while. And that's okay. But I, I think, I think the, the, the quest should be for balance. That So if, if, if you're a pendulum sitting at, at this comfortable equilibrium and someone smacks you off to the side, you're going to move. And like trying to force against that, it's just going to create pressure. Sometimes what you need to do is you've got to accept the fact that it's going to take a little bit to get back to equilibrium. And, and, and I know this has sort of been a theme, but you need to, of the other stuff I'm saying, but you got to give yourself permission to go through what is totally reasonable to go through. Um, and also give yourself permission to have space, but also give yourself permission to move on when you need to. And to, to be, you know, I had a patient once who said something I'll never forget. And um, someone who went through a very traumatic experience and struggled with it for many years. And one of the things she struggled with was this idea of, of is, is this emotional state that I'm in my fault? You know, because di I didn't cause it to happen to me. Um, so why do I have to deal with it? Because it is not my fault. Um, or is it my fault? And, and eventually, one of the things she said was, um, whether or not it's my fault is irrelevant. At the end of the day, it's my responsibility. And it can't be anybody else's. And so whatever it is that you're stressed about, you know, it may or may not be your fault. 
But at the end of the day, we need to be responsible to ourselves. Sometimes that means caring for ourselves. And sometimes that means um, getting ourselves out of bed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so, so in a lot of ways, this is like, you know, people have talked about this like it's a wartime. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. Um, I don't know. I mean, sure, there's parallels, but it, it definitely, it's definitely a lot more like a natural disaster that just is happening everywhere sort of all at once, but not equally everywhere, which is making it more difficult. But th that's sort of what it is. Yes, a tornado is, is, is tearing through the town right now. Now is not the time to, you know, have a baby shower. You know, in, in, you know if, if there's a tornado in the middle of the town, you know, like now's the time to just sort of get underground in your, in your, you know, tornado shelter and ride out the storm and then we'll come back out. And, and that may be stressful, um, but, we'll, but we are all in this together um, and we can help each other out. Sure. Talking about the uh, being a war. There is a parallel with what Richard Nixon did when he said we are declaring war on cancer. <laughs> and this old imagery persists 30 years later and has created lots of problems. When you are dealing with the biological issues, saying that you are at war with it, I think is the wrong metaphor. Well, I'm, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know much about politics, but usually... You know, I, I don't think the virus has declared war on us, you know, and, and you know, it takes, it takes two to be at war, I think. Um, the virus is not at war on our, with us. It, it, do, it probably doesn't even know we exist. Um, and it's hard, you know, if, if anyone has had an argument with somebody who's completely non-responsive and doesn't even know you're arguing with them, um, it's very unsatisfying. You know, if, if anyone has yelled at someone online and the person that never responds or doesn't even see your comments, and you think you're having this big argument, that's a very frustrating thing to be at. That's sort of where we are right now. For people who think we're at war with this, I, I don't know that it's a war because it's not fighting us. It's just trying to survive and it doesn't even know we exist, probably. Um, yeah. But what we're doing is, what, we're, what it is, is it's a force of nature that, we're, that we are trying to either acclimate to, respond to, adapt to, and, and also and also figure out how to exist in the context of while it's a way, it's more, it's more of a wave crashing over us than it is, um, than it is an enemy ship in the water. I mean, you don't go to war with the ocean, you know? Yeah. And the frontline responders are not at war with the virus. They are mm -hmm. here to save lives. Right. Not to be at war. No. But, but it's, it's imagery that people can wrap their head around. And yeah. because, but, you know, I, I think reality is a little more. Uh, so, Dr. Graner, you also have done lots of research on sleep. Yes. And I wanted to ask you some question about sleep. Sure. sure. Do you know, do you have, do you start to have any kind of data to show what is happening to people's sleep during this pandemic? So we don't have data yet. Um, people are collecting it. Uh, we'll, we're also collecting some, um, but just from, from the many people that I've talked to, I've seen three different patterns emerge. One pattern is actually a good one where people don't have to wake up as early to go to work. We've eliminated commute times for a lot of people and we've, in, we, we've permitted napping now, you know, all these things that the industrial revolution swept away, like waking up at your natural time and having a flexible schedule and being allowed to nap, we're, we now have. And for some people, that's great. Um, I have a, so, so my clinic is still open, but we're doing all virtual visits. And, and so last week, I had, a, I had a, um, you know, a point with a patient, and we were talking about his insomnia. And, and you know, he's like, honestly, I'm sleeping way better now. You know, I, don't have to, I don't have my alarm set for five in the morning. So when I have my early morning awakening at, say, four o'clock, I don't panic that I'm not going to be able to get any more sleep. I just get up for an hour, then I go back to bed and sleep for a couple hours, then I feel fine during the day, just start my day later. Um, there's a lot of people out there like that, either people who were sleep deprived or even had insomnia, and now giving them flexibility is improving things, and they're feeling better during the day and sleeping more. 
Um, there's an, a, another pattern. There's there's two other patterns though that are a little more concern, concerning. One is the people who are highly reactive and having more trouble sleeping because of stress. Um, and the other the other issue is more of a circadian one where people are becoming very dysregulated mm-hmm. and their schedule is sort of disintegrating and their rhythms are sort of disintegrating and they're staying inside and not getting natural light. And so what happens is their rhythms are getting all desynchronized. So not only are they asleep and awake at, you know, so there are people who are talking about like starting to free run. Um, they don't know that that's what that's called, but they're like, I'm getting up later and later every day. I'm like now I'm getting up in the middle of the afternoon. Why is that? Um, because you're not going outside and you have all the windows closed um, and, and you've got no rhythm. Um, so that, so there's, there's that dysregulated pattern and, and because of, of how circadian rhythms play a role in all these other areas of health, you know, now is not a time to be totally dysregulated if you want a stronger immune system. So anyway, those are the three patterns I'm seeing. One is a good one where more flexibility is good for people. Um, two of them are more problematic. One where people have a hard time sleeping, especially people who are, you know, just bathing themselves in news and numbers and death rates and stories about this, and they have a really hard time disconnecting. Um, even, even though the news doesn't care whether they watch it or not, um, the facts don't change whether they see it or not. And, and if they don't have the power to control it, um, it's, it's sort of, it, it sort of becomes irrelevant. Um, and so you have to figure out a way to disconnect for your own sake. Like it doesn't help anything to stay connected right to the point you get to bed. So you have to find a way to disconnect for your own sake so you can get enough sleep so that your body can work properly. And the same thing with the, the dysregulated circadian rhythms. And a lot of times these are going together. Um, and I think it's important to mention that, especially now, because, um, because right now we're, we're very con- concerned about making sure that our immune system is in top shape, not be- just because there's a pathogen but because you know, all the news is showing that the pathogen specifically is worse in people with compromised immune systems. And you know, there, there are a lot of things out there that can help keep your immune system at running as well as possible. And honestly, those things are healthy diet, plenty of exercise, staying away from smoking and, and, and excessive drinking, and getting uh, enough quality sleep at the right time. I mean, there's, you know, I can let other people speak about the other ones, but sleep is something I know something about. And there, there's a whole bunch of data now that shows that when you sleep deprive people, it impairs your ability for your immune system to function properly. Not only are you more likely to get sick, you are, you are, when you get sick, you get sicker, and it is harder for you to recover. Um, you, and especially there's data looking at viral infections where lack of sleep increases uh, risk for viral infection. Um, and part of it also has to do with the fact that the immune system is, is intimately controlling your, your body's uh, regeneration and, and repair processes that are, a lot of these are occurring during sleep. That's why sleep is the place for regeneration and repair um, because it's tied with the immune system in that way. And so when you're not getting the sleep that you need, your immune system is just a little, a little less able to do its job. Um, and then there's the circadian angle, where there's actually all kinds of circadian data now, independent of sleep, showing that when you have irregular rhythms and when your rhythms become dysregulated, it also affects your ability of the immune system to function properly. I mean, you know, we're, we're a very complex machine. And, but if one of the gears starts drifting out of whack with the others, it can cause reverberations through the whole system. And there's quite a lot of data now that shows that sleep and circadian rhythms are really important to immune system function. And so, I, you know, it may or may not make the distant difference between somebody being great versus terrible. But, you know, if you can move the needle a little bit, it may make a big difference for some people, especially people with existing sleep disorders, with like sleep apnea, which itself is associated with um, some uh, immune function uh, problems and heart disease and diabetes and obesity and all these other things that also impact the immune system uh, and are associated with complications. So I would be, um, 
I would be especially concerned with sleep apnea patients and, and other sleep disorders patients to make sure that use this time to protect your sleep. Teresa, did you have a question? Yes, I do. I was wanting to take a little bit of time to think about possibly since we are on slow mo right now, do it, would this be a good time for for individuals to pay attention to perhaps an underlying sleep disorder or maybe their loved ones, you know, having the time and, you know, to be careful and explain to them or maybe even tape them snoring, you know, because so many people are just not wanting to admit that there could be a problem. Is there some creative ways that people could come up with to perhaps, you know, get screened or, you know, get on telehealth or uh, just, you know, investigate that sleep and see, you know, is he snoring? Is she snoring? Are they stopping breathing? You know, those kinds of issues, because I think a lot of times it's just, oh, I'll get to that one day. I'll get to that. Right. I'll get to that, but I'm busy. So could you speak to that, please? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, so I was talking about how how sleep disorders like like insomnia, but also other and, and sleep apnea and, and others um, could be associated with with immune and metabolic issues. And you know the, the thing about sleep apnea in particular is that it is shockingly common, and most people who have it don't know. And this is a great opportunity. So so like my clinic is mostly focused on insomnia, and, and we're like I said, we're open and we're still seeing people. Um, the clinic, the, the sleep medicine clinic here at the University of Arizona that's run by Saiparth Srathi, so they're still open as well. They're doing all telehealth visits and home sleep studies. Um, you know, they, they're, they paused all in-lab visits and all in-lab studies, but they're still doing home sleep studies. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of clinics around the country that a lot of people might not realize are still open for business because you can do this remotely. You know, you can... Um, there's still a lot of, of home studies that can be done, that can be read remotely, that can be downloaded. Um, it's doable. And I think, that, um, I think that now is a great time for, you know, maybe you have some extra time on your hands. You don't have to wake up extra early for work. You can actually wear it. And if you have a rough night with it, you can, you know, get it reset for a second night. You know, I, I would say do that. And, and, and don't forget, a lot of the sleep labs are still open, not with people going to work, but, you know, if there's one area of medicine that is perfect for telehealth, it's behavioral health, it's psychiatry and psychology. But if there's a second um, area of medicine that's perfect for telehealth, it would be sleep medicine. I think that's great advice because uh, you know we hear that a lot um, that from our community that you know there's just isn't time. You know I'm busy with my family, I'm busy with work, I have all these things I need to do, or and I'm, I'll just get around with it. So now. Everybody does have some time, so you can reach out to your, you know, physician. Um, you know, we had a an appointment, a telemed appointment with, you know, my daughter uh, the other day. It was it was it was pretty easy. Um, you know, just like we're all remote here talking today, it's pretty much the same thing. So, Great. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity for any, uh, you know, wrap up thoughts or any final comments. Um, Jills, would you like to go first and give anything? Uh, um, I have one more question for Dr. Sure. Brenner. Since sleep apnea is associated with many like serious comorbidities, co other medical conditions that requires um, medications, do we have any idea of what's happening with patient uh, compliance with medications during this period of time? That's a, that's a great question. I don't know that there's data. Um, Fortunately, I mean, the, the area where you are seeing huge problems with medications are when people are hoarding medications um, that, that, that may or may not be appropriate, like the lupus patients and stuff like that. For the sleep apnea patients, I, I think especially the ones with respiratory diseases like asthma or COPD or emphysema, they might be having problems getting prescriptions filled um, if everyone is sort of stockpiling on these medications. Um, also sedatives, you know, um, there's, you know, for, for intubations, intubations require sedation. And 
you know, there's actually, there may, there may be some impact on sedative medications. I mean, probably not sleep related hypnotics, but you know, if you see all the list of all the kinds of medications that, that patients come to me in, on in clinic, you know, there's a long list of things that people are taking. So some of those yeah. might be impacted and some of the respiratory stuff. I don't think there's, there's as much of an issue with things like CPAPs or, or heart medication. I don't think that those are having a problem yet, especially if people can get home delivery uh, by mail. Um, but yeah, I mean, adherence is always a problem. Um, people being able to stick to treatment is always a problem. I would say, especially now, look, if you've been lax in the past, now's not the time. Yes. Uh, I was asking you the question because of my own experience. I have high blood pressure and I've not always been so compliant that I can guarantee you I wake <laughs> up every morning and the first thing I do is to take my medication against uh, high blood pressure. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's not, it, it's, it, if it's, it's it, not the time. Now, now is not the it. time you want to mess with that. That's good advice. Teresa, have anything uh, to chime in about? Well, you know, I have a <laughs> shameless plug. I am uh, the proud parent of the uh, support group on Facebook. And sometimes we have the, uh, the fortune to have Dr. Grander come and visit. He's one of our members. So if you would like to... Uh, come and see him sometime, you know, giving advice to people, which is great uh, advice. Uh, so happy to have you. Do I sound like a groupie or what? Uh, he's just, he really, I mean, he's just, you know, I have shoes older than him, but he is, he is so real. And, and, you know, that's so important to our patients that, uh, you know, you're not talking medical jargon, you're talking real. And we really appreciate that. So, no, anyway, in, in if, my mind, it's like, you know, how would I want exactly. to talk to me? Like, That's what right. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and, and so that Facebook group is great. Um, there's a whole, there's a bunch of us on there who are sleep people. And so people will post questions. Usually someone from the community will answer well enough. But every once in a while, someone, there's either a question that, that someone doesn't know the answer, that, that the community itself might not be able to answer or someone says something that I have to jump in and say, wait a bit of a, hold on a second. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like yeah. just, just want to make sure that like, you know, that, that this is legit or this is not legit or we totally appreciate or, like, that. You know, people are saying that. this, but like, here's the deal. Like, you know, so, so no, I think it's a great group. And, and especially, especially during this time, you know, where you can actually connect. With oh yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming and talking to our folks. They, they enjoy it when you're there, and we do too. Uh, well, before I, I wrap up, uh, Dr. Grander, I'd like to ask you, um, I have some numbers here that I mentioned in the beginning for people to you know, yeah. reach out if they are uh, finding uh, certain feelings to be too excessive to them. Would you like to talk just for a, a quick you know, 30 seconds about what type of feelings that if someone's having that they should reach out to one of the numbers that I'll give? Sure. Um, look, this could be a really tough time. And, and going along with my theme of giving yourself permission to be a human being. Um, first of all, I, I want people to recognize that they have permission to feel all kinds of things. Um, and they also have permission to ask for help about it. So like, if you, you, you don't need to be on your last thread to ask for help. Um, just like you don't need to be on your deathbed before you go to the doctor and ask for medicine, right? You don't need to. And if you did that, you'd be seen as, uh, why did you wait so long, right? Um, like we all have family members who do that. Like, seriously, just go to the doctor. Like, it's fine. You know, you'll, you'll get better faster. And, and, but we have a hard time seeing that with mental health, where we think that mental health is either for people with severe mental illness, like schizophrenia or something where they're not able to care for themselves, or it's only for people who are sort of on their last straw and having, and having so much difficulty coping with life that they just can't get from one day to the next. And that's been going on for a long time. Um, you know, if, if you fall out of a tree and, and break your leg, don't try, don't try walking on it for six months before going to the doctor. You go right in. And it's the same thing with mental health. You, you have permission to reach out to people. 
And it actually works better that way. I mean, trust me, it's much easier for me to treat a case of insomnia or, or, or anxiety that came about in the last couple of weeks. And like someone who said, oh, I've had this for 20 years. I've tried everything, nothing like you've tried everything except for like the things that I know will help because you, you, you know, you Googled and like, you don't know because you're not an expert in this area. So I guess that's what I'm trying to tell people. Like your threshold for seeking help sh is, should probably be lower than you think it is. And that's okay. Totally okay. Um, but especially if you're at the point where, uh, so there's a couple of things that should be major red flags for you that where you should say, you know, this is the equivalent to, you know, I am bleeding and I can't stop it. You know, the level of you need to go to the doctor. One is if you have for at least the last, for about the last two weeks, if more than half of those days in the last two weeks, you felt, um, like down or depressed or hopeless or, or, or just like feeling really negative about yourself or the world or, or the future, you know, and, and, it's, and it's starting to get in the way of your ability to function, deal with it now. Um, another one is some people don't have that, but what they have is like this numbness where they're, they're just blah all the time. And even things that should make them happy don't. That's a major red flag. Uh, it's called anhedonia. Um, a lot of people with depression don't don't feel like this hopelessness. I am terrible. I feel really guilty. Like a lot of those sort of sensations. What they get is they just have no that the whole world is gray and there's no light. And you know their favorite movie doesn't make them laugh. And their friends you know are a burden. And like and all the nothing is positive. If that's been going on, that's another major red flag. And it's treatable. Same thing with anxiety. So if you have the if you're at the point where your anxiety is paralyzing or you're having panic attacks frequently enough where it's interfering with your ability to function or if you have trouble controlling worries about things even if it's maybe it's one big thing maybe it's lots of little things if you're finding yourself rearranging your life so that um so that these things um are are not getting in your way of your ability to function that's another major red flag um and, 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 you know, most importantly, you know, I talked about this at the ASAA awake meeting talking about suicide ideation. So if you're at the point where you're, where you're actually seriously starting to put a plan together or thinking about putting a plan together or um, at the point where you are no longer able to um, make a decision for your own safety, um, call. So th th those are some major red flags. And if you've got any of those, don't put it off. This is, this is, this is a I'm bleeding and it's not stopping moment. Like you need to get treatment at that point. Right. We have listed up here some um, organizations and telephone numbers that people can reach out to uh, for, you know, for help. And that is definitely um, something we want to impress upon our, our community and to, you know, reach out to their family and friends with that. Um, I would also like to just... Um, uh, revisit the fact that, you know, while we all are at home, and as you said before, um, the telemed uh, function for all physicians is, is running. So, you know, yeah. reach out to your doctors uh, if you're having any sort of issue and, you know, maybe tackle some of those things that you put on the back burner, a sleep study, talking about your sleep, whatever it may be. Um, the physicians are still there out there to, to help us all. So, well, I just want to wrap up today. Thank Dr. Grander for joining us again. Um, as Teresa said, we always uh, enjoy his company in our community and, and, and with our leaders. And we're happy to have you as part of our uh, speaker series. So we encourage everyone here to visit us at sleepapnea.org. And our speaker series is um, going, um, dropping online every Tuesday and Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. So we'll see you at the next round. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. 